Uh, we're actually going to cross now to a uh, journalist commentator, a person who has uh, a degree in uh, international studies and politics, uh, Australia-based. Uh, he's the author of the Civic Duty Media Resource. Uh, his name is Daniel. And we're actually going to give Daniel the opportunity to interrogate the Aussie Cossack and ask any question he likes. Daniel, welcome to the Aussie Cossack Show. Uh, yes, I thank you very much for having me. Well, mate, the floor is yours. Whatever you'd like to ask, uh, I'll just attach the lie detector to my uh, wrist here and you can go ahead and uh, spur some questions out. I've noticed you've uh, been quite busy interviewing all sorts of different Australian media personalities. And even though the, you're on the Aussie Cossack show, I'll throw the reins over to you and um, you can uh, pick my brain and explore any question. I, I imagine you're going to talk about the Russia-Ukraine situation. So uh, where would you like to start? Uh, well, um just um, not to bore your audience, but just for my own audience, could you um, please start uh, start by giving a little bit of your background and um, how, you, how you got into the whole alternative media space? Well, mate, uh, my background, born in Australia, born in Sydney, 1990, grew up in Western Sydney, went to school at Croydon Public School in, in primary school, uh, in kindergarten year one, then at prep school, primary school, prep school, enrolled in year three to Trinity Grammar School in Strathfield, uh, played footy for the first 15, was a choir boy at the Trinity Singers, played in the Trinity uh, Orchestra on the first violin. He played violin for 12 years. It was very, uh, very traumatizing, that experience. <laughs> although although I enjoy music, mate, there was, you know, having uh, Russian parents, a dad was a priest, uh, mum was a teacher. They were very uh, strict, very strict, always uh, forcing me to do one hour of violin every day. Then I stopped playing violin as soon as I was old enough to uh, stop playing violin. Um, and uh, I enjoyed playing the accordion, actually, funny enough. Wow. Uh, but continued studying through high school. Uh, did a few years at St. Andrew's Cathedral School in the city. It was always a bit of a rebel at school, to be honest. The, the teachers would always uh, complain, you know, Simeon's a leader, but he's a leader for the bad. We want him to be a leader for the good. The uh, principal at St. Andrews said, we want you to be the school captain, but you're worried you'll uh, we'll start a coup d'etat in the school. <laughs> so it was, it, was always, uh, it was always a challenge. It was always a challenge. But um, so those, you, um, you went against the establishment early in life. Well, you, you see, also because my father was a priest, uh, those schools that were attached to the Anglican Church, mm. Trinity Grammar School, for example, they offered a scholarship for the sons of clergymen. And it didn't, didn't matter what denomination. So we were Russian Orthodox, but uh, they couldn't discriminate. So they already had a chip on their shoulder against me. All this guy's here on a scholarship and he's a, he's a rat bag. I mean, I was good at sport. I was good at modern history, uh, English. Uh, didn't like maths at all. Didn't like science. And I was always a bit of a stirrer. Right. Uh, and uh, center of attention, that kind of stuff. But I look back at that now, uh, you know, looking back at my school reports, teachers were always against me. I mean, what's wrong with that? You know, if my son went to school and he came home from school and the teacher wrote a comment in his diary saying, uh, Mr. Boykoff, your son is the center of attention and he's um, you know, doing this and doing that, and he's, I would say, what's, what's wrong with that? Good on him. Go. <laughs> you know, I'd rather have a kid who's, who's vibrant, who's energetic, who's uh, social, than a kid who's sitting in the corner with no friends and uh, looks like he needs some defibrillators and a shot of adrenaline to wake him up. <laughs> right. So, but that, that's but that that's the trend in Australia, isn't it? You get kids who are hyperactive and they put them on, on drugs instead of giving them a basketball and a cricket bat and saying, go play sport. You know, there is no ADHD or ADD in Russia. It's in Australia that they've got this. They've got right. 30% of the kids have got mental illness and they're on uh, uh, amphetamine-based uh, uh, medicine, which is forced on them by the teachers and by the uh, Department of Health. It's a disgrace. Well, yeah, that, that goes well, go a little bit off topic, but um, that goes back to the actual um, education system itself. I think it's very much um, catered to more, I suppose, girls' way of doing things, being, being you know, uh, quiet and sit, sit down for long periods of time and be attentive, and boys have more energy to burn. So, uh, so you know, we get bored easy, and then we go and concentrate, and then we... Uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, God knows what. 
Mate, I, I couldn't study anymore. I mean, you you were uh, completed a degree in uh, politics and international studies. Congratulations. And you know, my mother-in-law and my wife often tells me, they say, oh, you should go and study. You should be a lawyer. You should do this. I mean, yes, I'd probably be a good lawyer with the gift of the gab, but I would not be able to study. I would not be able to sit there in a lecture and listen to somebody and do homework. I can't. I mean, I did a few years in the seminary. I think that's enough. Uh, <laughs> I can't well, do it anymore. Well, my, my, my case, um, it's more of a case of I was not academic at all growing up. I basically failed <laughs> nearly everything. I wasn't very good at all student. But when I hit 25, it was like a light bulb went off. And I got, I originally wanted to become a forensic psychologist. I would enjoy the police. But um, I got into politics and I self-educated for two, three years on my own. And then I wanted to see if I was not living in an echo chamber created by myself, for myself. So I, I decided to go to uni. So I started my university in my late 20s. So um, I'm not like everyone else. I, I usually people finish the masters at 20, 28. I started at 28, my undergraduate. So um, I'm a I'm a little really off um, off the normal track compared to other people. I think in some ways it was a good thing. I, I went in, I went to uni later in life when I was when I was more mature as opposed to straight out straight out of uni. And um, I suppose that kept me from getting brainwashed too. So what was it like with all the uh, uni kids there having parties and socialising? And you were uh, you know significantly older than them. Well, I, I didn't live on campus. I, I went to uni and went home. So um, uh, I didn't know if I was there partying. But um, uh, you could tell in the classroom, though, the difference in mentality, um, just because I was happened to be slightly more older than them. For example, a lot of them would be more on the um, idealistic, um, uh, liberal side of doing things. And I would be, I suppose, a bit more on the realist side and a little bit more um you know grounded a bit more serious in my, my my answers to certain questions um so yeah i noticed that i noticed that a lot actually uh the difference between us well there you go so you graduated uh was the uh scene in the uni and the, from the lectures and the syllabus would you say it was um anti anti-russian in, in your time uh Mm, not really. I think I, I, I finished my master's in late 2018 or mid 2018. And although things were happening, it wasn't quite as bad as it is now. I think I left just before things really heated up. Yeah. Uh, but, but I can, um, but since leaving, I, I, you know, keep my eye, my, my ear to the ground and I can hear other people comment, other commentators and things like that. And, Unfortunately, yeah, uh, even some commentators that you would think would know better when it came to, I mean, I, I always said that the, uh, the lessons of, of, uh, the war and terror, uh, you know, when that happened, we had a huge anti-war movement going on, going on. And, uh, there was so much. You, you mean uh, the, you mean the war of terror? Well, yeah, <laughs> officially, <laughs> officially war, uh, uh, war on terror, but you know, uh, that's a whole other uh, way of looking at it. Well, but, you, you make a good point. It's the uni students, it's the left that are supposed to be marching and saying no to committing Australia into a war and sending our weapons and sending our troops. But uh, since the days of COVID and since the days of all this anti-Russian hysteria, the left has just changed. It's the left well, that are walking around wearing masks, getting five jabs, uh, in, you know, saying everyone should be locked down and not walking out of their homes, not being allowed to go to church, not being allowed to visit each other. And then it's the left. Uh, it's not even, I don't know, know what to call them. They're not really the left. I mean, the real left of the good old days, of the days of the trade unions and the anti-war Vietnam marches, I mean, they had some respect. Uh, the, the, those uh, lefties back in the day who used to vote Labor and be all about you know the people and the workers, they got nothing to do with the left of today who are pushing God knows what uh, in the educational institutions. And the problem is... Uh, in our universities. And the problem is that it's these people in our universities who profess this ideology uh, that are the ones that are going to go on to become policymakers, that are going go to go to become uh, mainstream media, uh, mouthpieces, government officials, and are going to be 
uh, in our parliaments pushing their agendas. I mean, look at our parliaments already now. You got Teal, you got Greens, and you've got a Labor majority. And of course, there's nothing going to be good coming out of that at all, is there? Well, um, on top of all that, the uh, Liberal Party is supposed to be the Conservatives aren't very conservative on top of it. So, um, we're, we're, to be honest, I do think the whole left-right paradigm is a little bit now out of date. I don't think it's no longer applicable. Uh, really, it's either totalitarianism versus freedom. And both sides of the issue transcend, transcend left and right. But that's the real paradigm. And as you said, the the left of a previous generation, um, I think the left has gone so far left, those type of liberals, like let's say, uh, oh, in American terms, let's say America with JFK, the party, the Democratic Party have gone so far left, JFK would be demonized as a conservative today, by today's standards. So the whole everyone's completely out of sync now. Um, there's a great book called JFK Conservative, and it basically analyzed his whole life, his speeches, his policies, and by he would be a Republican by if he was around today. I mean, look at today with uh, RFK Jr. I mean, his own party can't stand him. Uh, so, uh, as you said, the left of, of today, uh, they're not the same. And, um, and I don't know, it's weird. When it comes to Russia, it almost is that everyone's brain switched off and all the lessons learned from the uh, war on terror and Saddam Hussein and all that stuff. Because the same arguments would go with being used. Like, uh, if you were against the uh, war uh, in the Iraq war, you criticized it. Oh, you know, Saddam's a bad man. You want him to, you want him to uh, stay in power. You, you love Saddam, blah, 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 blah. And now it's the same arguments. If you're, you know, if you're critical of the official narrative of the Russian Ukraine war, oh, you're a Putinista. You love Putin. You, you want Putin, uh, in Australia, you know. So it's, it's the same arguments going on, but the anti, anti war movement, left or right, is basically non existent these days. It's very, uh, disturbing. It's very, uh, disturbing indeed. Uh, but the public opinion is changing. I have to say, I wish there would be. Oh, well, maybe this can be a TNT radio project where we can, we can commission a uh, independent uh, poll, a real poll, you know, a research poll where uh, a credible polling agency uh, asks uh, credible uh, in, a, in a credible fashion. And I, I stress the word credible because when we see these polls from you know the Doherty Institute or the Lowy Institute or these uh, ASPE groups. We know that they're all skewed and rigged, they're biased. But I would love to see a poll asking Australians about their opinions relating to the Russia-NATO conflict in Ukraine. Because I can see uh, for myself that opinions are changing. The opinion uh, that the government has pushing, the government narrative, it's collapsing. It's collapsing. And many people have just realized that now. Many people realized that in February 2022 from day one. And if you're one of those people who realized from the very beginning that Russia is not the bad guy and Russia is actually doing uh, the, you know, God's work over there, congratulations. If it took you a few weeks or a few months, it's okay because you were probably inundated and you are probably blindsided by Western mainstream media propaganda and following the uh, government narrative. Uh, but many people are coming around to that realization uh, now and more than ever now, Australians, maybe even they're not so sympathetic to Russia and Vladimir Putin, but they're certainly against Australia's involvement or any further involvement. Enough is enough. We've got homelessness in Australia at record levels. We've got interest rates at record levels. The cost of living is through the roof. We've got so many problems back home and our own defence force chiefs are admitting that we're completely defenceless. We're open to attack if a foreign power, a Pacific power, for example, should wish to do so. And here we are depleting ourselves, purging ourselves of our last military equipment, our last military assets. I mean, that is just treasonous. Treasonous, I call it, Daniel. Well, the same thing's happening in Britain too. I mean, there's reports that Britain, their, their stock take in military uh, ammunition and weaponry is at an all-time low. I mean... This war could have been stopped a while ago, but it was Boris Johnson 
who went over there and got into uh, Levinsky's ear and um, basically told him to keep on going, we'll keep on funding you. And this, this war has been dragging on since. Um, I think Putin at the very beginning had was correct in his, in his initial plan in basically uh, hard and fa- hit them hard and fast and go for a peace deal. And I think initially it was wor- working, but I don't think he um, uh, could believe just how much uh, support that the uh, NATO, EU, and America and Britain would give Ukraine. Uh, but he, but he's correct when he, in his speeches when he said this isn't really about Ukraine. It, it's really a, a it's a globalist um, basically war v- using Ukraine as the proxy, and um, it's, it's bigger than what's being reported. Uh, that I think that's what's really going on, and because of I but the West, especially Australia, we have this narrative that we're always the good guys. We never did anything wrong. We uh, we can't imagine that uh, we could be on the wrong side of history. But I well, think it's similar we, to what during, during the days of the vaccines and the, and the lockdowns, people didn't want to a- accept, come to terms with the realisation that the Australian government, the New South Wales Department of Health, uh, the police are actually against the Australian people. For some people, for many people, that that concept, that reality, was was you know too far to to comprehend, too dangerous, too scary to fathom, and they preferred to believe the Australian narrative, the Australian media narrative. They preferred to sit back, watch press conferences from Gladys Berejiklian and Kerry Chant and Dan Andrews and McGowan and Palaszczuk and uh, the rest of them, and just believe what the government was telling them. And for them, it's safer because it takes a lot of, you know, people in Australia are, are very uh, hey, easygoing and they've got the Shilby Road attitude. They're not the type of people to go and uh, uh, rebel against their own governments and disagree with government health advice. And thankfully, we did have uh, millions of Australians who stood up in the end. And let's just take this opportunity again to thank all of those Aussies out there who marched, who protested, who spoke up, because it's only thanks to you that the government stop was stopped in its tracks to the point now where the government's handing out, paying tens of millions of dollars in compensation to uh, those millions of Australians who received the vaccine and got vaccine injuries. That's what the mainstream media should be talking about. I mean, of course, they're not. But they're using the same tactics, and the Russian the Russian Ukraine situation uh, was perfect timing for the West, because the West needed uh, to replace to create a smokescreen, you could say, to replace uh, the donkey, uh, the carrot in front of the donkey uh, uh, for the people's public consumption. So the people had no time to look back and say, "Hang on a second, the government tricked us." Hang on a second, the vaccine is actually. It gave us injuries. Hang on a second. Why did you force us to take them? Hang on a second. Why did you force our elderly and our children to take them? How many people were killed? There was no time to, to ask those questions because it, all of a sudden the mainstream media day and night was talking about Russia, 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 Russian missiles, Russian hacking, Russian election interference, Russian Vladimir Putin, Putin's missile, Putin's war, bloody Putin, bad Russians, terrible Russians, Russian spies, Russian agents. And that's their narrative, which was conveniently, very conveniently replaced uh, for those uh, people who follow the government narrative, who follow the current thing. And as this uh, government narrative on the Ukraine situation is beginning to collapse, the government will find something else. And that could be climate change, that could be the voice, that could be a raft of uh, other issues which they're trying to uh, get us thinking about. They're trying to occupy our minds and our attention. I mean, personally for me, uh, Daniel, I don't care about the voice. Stuff the voice. It's For me, it's irrelevant because I believe that it's a government uh, designated distraction to create the illusion of uh, choice and conversation, to empower people, to make people think that they have a choice, that they're going off to the polls and they're going to vote yes or no. Who cares at the end of the day? not going to change anything. Whatever the Australian government actually wants to do, they will do. 
uh, if they actually cared our, about our opinion, they would have asked us before they uh, voted in the Identify and Disrupt Bill. They would have asked us before they took away all of our freedoms uh, from the point of view of electronic surveillance, cashless society, uh, sending off our troops and weapons overseas. Where was our opinion when it came to those questions? Whether or not there should be a smoking ceremony or a corroboree at a building site, uh, seriously, that's not that, that's not something which is a, a referendum level situation. But that's what the government wants. They want everyone to feel like they're in charge, to feel like the people's opinion counts. And it's a designated distraction, in my opinion. There you go. But at the same time, at the same time, Russia is gaining support all around the world. Those uh, countries out there uh, from BRICS, uh, the majority of uh, the world's population, have always had a pro-Russian position. India, China, Brazil. You know, just there you've got uh, almost half the world's population in those few countries in BRICS, uh, plus South Africa, and the, all the other countries who are aiming to join BRICS, like Iran. Uh, uh, the West is, uh, is losing the uh, battle for the unipolar world. The world is becoming a multipolar world. But once again, it's Russia who uh, is paving the way. It's Russia who is fighting Nazism. It's Russia who is fighting for the freedom of everybody out there around them. I mean, you studied international relations and politics. Uh, judging from what I've said and those views which I've put forward, uh, my assessment of the change in public opinion in Australia, do you agree that public opinion is changing uh, in a pro-Russian uh, direction? Well, from everything you just said, I basically um, uh, agree. I uh, come to very much the same uh, points that you have. Um, in regards to Australian people changing their position, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe a little bit. But I know definitely in other countries they are. Um, my background is Italian, so I, I do follow the uh, Italian news. And now slowly slowly on the on the italian radio programs and tv programs you can finally start to see more criticism and more um uh thinking about things more more objectively now than it was before a few a few years ago at one stage as soon as you mentioned anything i don't know, even objective you'll be demonized as being you know pro pro putin stooge or whatever uh, I think maybe in Australia, maybe a little bit, it's starting to loosen up a little bit, but I think we've got a ways to go in, in, in that regard. Uh, the reasoning for that, uh, I think, as you said, Australia is very much a very laid back country, uh, but I think that goes back to our founding. I mean, Australia was created as an outpost for the, for the British Empire in, in Asia. And because of that, we didn't have to, all our, or laws or politics, uh, a way of life, everything is basically handed to us. Uh, you know, here you go, British, follow that. And if you're good boys and girls, you might be welcomed back into the motherland of polite society of, of Britain. Uh, unlike, I suppose, like the Americans that had a revolution <laughs> that actually fought uh, had to fight back. They had to decide themselves what system they wanted and what laws they wanted, and what people they wanted to be. Uh, that changes the people. And that's why you see a lot more. Uh, and the same thing with Russia. Russia had, you know, uh, uh, revolutions, um, uh, coups, uh, civil wars, um, all these other things that are going on, on with it. So it changes the people. And I think that's why you saw the Australians during lockdown and, and even with every other official narrative, has this laid back attitude of going, well, no, no, everything's all right. I can't admit to myself that my own government could do something terrible. Um, you know, don't exaggerate. I don't want to know about it. It can't be true. But other, other populations, like I said, Russia and Americans and other, and other Europeans, uh, they've been through all that. Um, I had a friend who was Russian, a Russian descent, and during the lockdowns and, and the mandates and all that stuff, she was saying that the Eastern European population in Australia was 
aghast of what was going on about the surveillance and the people Australians were reporting and spying on each other and and uh, uh, demonizing each other and not wanting to be around each other uh, I think because uh, and the centralization of power to the government and all that uh, I think because you know they've been through that in regards to especially the older generation in regards to the Soviet Union so I think they saw the writing on the wall, and they're, they're really freaked out. And Australians have got, Australians have don't have da Daniel, out. Daniel, uh, Daniel. I, I like what I'm hearing. You've got a good position. Uh, I wonder how many people out there agree with you. One eight hundred six seven zero three one zero. If you want to have your say, uh, we're going to speak to uh, Liz from Melbourne, who's waiting patiently on the line uh, after this break. But Daniel, before we go to the break, I want to ask you: Who or what? has been the main catalyst for uh, changing public opinion in Australia uh, from anti-Russian to pro-Russian over the last two years? An individual? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I know uh, an actual individual doesn't come to mind straight away, but um, I think just a general um, seeing what's going on and seeing how Every time the media predicts something, it doesn't come to pass. I, like, as you mentioned, the Russian, uh, the Ukraine counteroffensive and all that stuff, it never really comes to pass. And I think people are getting fed up of seeing so much resources and money being basically dumped in Ukraine and nothing happening. I think people are getting more fed up and more critical in their, in their behavior, as opposed to going, yes, yes, we have to do it. It's the perfect storm, isn't it? We've got the uh, cost of living. You've got the ScoMo government pushed everyone into mortgages and promising there wouldn't be any rate rises. The IBA governor promised. Then the Albo government comes in and raises the rates, you know, consecutively how many times in a row to the point where people are uh, absolutely just uh, on the ropes. Families are struggling uh, in the suburbs out there. The rich are getting richer. And the Albanese government is sending weapons and money overseas. It would have been so much easier if they listened to us from the beginning where we said, please just declare neutrality. All Australia had to do was to declare neutrality. So I think it's time probably for us to have another a rally, a protest march. We'll uh, have a think about where we can do that. Maybe we'll have one in every single Australian capital city just to remind the Albanese government that the Australian people have absolutely had enough of this they, they are saying stop NATO, stop ALBO, uh, stop the supply of weapons, and the, the weapons stop, the war stops. It's very easy, very simple. The war stops when, once the weapons stop. But, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, from uh, Daniel uh, Civic Duty, his uh, organization is called. It's an independent media group, which is uh, uh, completely independent, and uh, of all the independents out there, no matter how small or big they are, we've got to support them, give them a go, because we're up against the 99% of the mainstream media. We'll be back uh, with Liz from Melbourne on TNT Radio after this break. All right, let's get this underway. For our first order of business, TNT Radio News. Matt Boylan here with a look at your TNT headlines. Donald Trump's fired off a salvo of shots at President Joe Biden for compromising America's national security by extinguishing morale in the U.S. military and taking a blowtorch to the country's weapon stockpiles. A former Australian police officer's been charged with more than 70 historical child sex offences. And anger has exploded in Iraq after a man who burned the Holy Quran outside a mosque in Sweden last month was allowed to stage a second protest this week. Globalist agendas, democratic rights at risk, corruption, propaganda. It never stops. Listen to TNT Radio anywhere you go. Ask Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's news talk. This is TNT Radio. Welcome back to TNT Radio. Uh, Ozzy Kozak uh, on a Saturday night live uh, from the Russian consulate. Liz from Melbourne uh, is on the line. Liz, what would you like to talk about? Oh, look, uh, Simeon, I just wanted to give you a, you know, big um, shout out that you're doing a fantastic job and uh, even with what you're bringing in is showing what uh, lifting about positivity about Russia. Um, 
I've spoken to you before. I've got uh, Polish background with Russian mother. Um, and I think what you're doing is really good. I think one of the things people um, need to stop listening to is too much of the mainstream media because that's where they're getting uh, not uh, the correct information of uh, actually what's going on. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's always... Everything's, oh, Russia did it, Russia, you know. I burnt my toast, oh, it must have been the Russian. Do you know what I mean? Um, there needs to be a lot <laughs> more positivity. <laughs> um, absolutely. Look, and the government uh, of Australia is bringing in new legislation that we all know about, the Ministry of Truth, as it's been come to be known, is going yes. to be deployed in Australia to counter dangerous misinformation. I wonder what they could be talking about. Now, they're not, they're not going to be Ooh. countering the misinformation where uh, the Doherty Institute and Big Pharma tell us to get five jabs. No, that's not dangerous at all. Uh, that's that's for <laughs> your health. That's not dangerous. But if it's a bloke uh, on YouTube or somebody on Twitter or an independent journalist uh, on Telegram or if it's Liz from Melbourne uh, who's just voicing her opinion on Facebook, oh, that's dangerous, yeah. dangerous misinformation. Stop her, arrest her and uh, gag her. We don't want her to talk about anything. We don't want her to criticise the government's narrative. Now, the Australian oh, government uh, points the finger when North Korea does this, but they're guilty of it uh, even worse. Well, you, you have a look at now, you know, let's look at um, Sounds of Freedom, the movies, um, you know, and a box office hit, which nobody ever wanted that information to get out. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's the same like they're always um, wanting to silence the truth coming out. It's the same with Russia. If something's happening, oh, it must be the Russians, you know. Uh, Crimea Bridge, oh, no, that was the Russians, you know. It's, uh, the truth isn't getting out there and people need to really look at, you know, uh, Telegram, whatever, alternate media to really get oh, the they, truth. Liz, they're coming for us. So I predict that Telegram is the next platform which they want to axe. They really cannot stand the fact that on Telegram we are able to share uh, stories, opinions, commentary, analysis, bring information uh, that is instant, right? There's a, for example, something happens on the other side of the world in the war zone or in politics or in uh, some kind of uh, sphere where the government doesn't want us to know about it. Bang, we're able to disseminate that information in the space of a few seconds to millions around the world. Uh, the mainstream well, media, they're in the dark age. That, that takes them two or three days to get a story out. Yeah, well, I think it's the same with um, now people are on Rumble and other things because um, they were getting onto YouTube and, you know, um, taking people down uh, that had their, um, had their say. It's, um, they're always trying to stop the truth coming out. That, that's what... I you know, Liz, uh, Liz, as, as, you, uh, as you speak, uh, I'm just imagining uh, the mindset, the psychology of the mainstream media presenters, journalists, reporters. I know for a fact, Liz, that they secretly appreciate our work uh, as average Aussies, as simple people, as independent voices. They know that we play a role. They know that people like you, Liz, in Melbourne and uh, millions out there who use social media and use alternative uh, um, sources to uh, get their news, they realise we play a role. Could you imagine if it was just the mainstream media? It would be a 1984-style society. Oh, there are exactly. journalists out there, there are journalists out there, good journalists, you know, people that work for Four Corners or Channel 9 or uh, mainstream radio stations, they have this sort of admiration. I'm telling you because I speak to them. I know about it. They have this admiration and they realise, they know, because they also love Australia. They also love a free country. They also want their kids to grow up in a, in a society, in a country where uh, having your say is not illegal. And that's, that's only normal. I mean, that's what, uh, that's what we want uh, our kids to enjoy, freedom of speech and their opinion. And they're, they're starting to themselves understand you know, they went along with it during the COVID times, during the lockdowns, because they were given hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks and government grants uh, in exchange for their allegiance, uh, in exchange for towing the line and spinning the narrative. 
And many of those presenters, many of those journalists, I mean, they're still good people who probably once upon a time uh, grew up in Australia, went to school, went to TAFE, went to university, wanted to be journalists for the right reasons deep down inside, except they got caught up in the corporate world of uh, serving the government uh, agenda, so spinning the narrative, and they've had enough of it. They, you know, a lot of them have gone into depression, honestly. Honestly, a lot of them are depressed. A lot of them are not happy with themselves. They've realized they're not only lying to the people, they're lying to themselves every time they uh, push the government narrative. You know, the media lied, people died. Innocent Australians, how many of them out there have died? We won't even know for sure because that information is also suppressed. I mean, my YouTube channel on Aussie Cossack, you probably used yeah. to watch it from the beginning. Uh, yeah. The, gov the government took it down. Why? Because uh, we shared a video uh, from the Senate, from Alex Antich, uh, during uh, uh, Parliament, where they were highlighting the excess amount of, amounts of deaths in Australia. Why all of a sudden uh, all these people are dying in Australia? It's abnormal. It's not normal. They didn't die from COVID. They died from myocarditis, pyocarditis, strokes, all this other stuff connected to the vaccine. I mean, why shouldn't we talk about that? The government itself, again, I've said this three times in tonight's program, the government itself is paying millions of dollars in compensation to people who have got vaccine injuries. Yet we, those independent journalists who went against the narrative in the beginning, where, when it wasn't popular, remember those days? Right in the beginning, we were the rebels. We were the ones who... We were oh, the, yeah. against the 99%. I, I could imagine how you felt because I felt that way when we felt the police are against us, the government's against us, the media's against us. And all we wanted was to warn our neighbours, our families, our friends not to take the jab, not to bow down and be pressured by the government coercion when we couldn't yeah, attend they funerals. Pressured it, they pressured it that much that, um, you know, employers or whatever would say, if you don't get the jab, you can't have a job. Do you know what I mean? Um, I yes, had to yes. go and get a fake, um, you know, and I got it off Telegram, actually, to say that I've had the shots when I didn't. Aren't you um, cheeky, I'm Liz, getting a I fake am. jab certificate from Telegram? <laughs> yes, I know it is, and I was very happy with it. And it's funny, the day I got it, the next day, uh, it must have been like the government or whatever had seen that that's going on, and I'd got it. It looked so authentic, perfect. And the next day, uh, my employer at that time said to me, you better show me that you've had your um, uh, jab and show me the certificate. And there you go. I gave my fake telegram certificate and kept my job. And you saved your health and you saved your life. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, and well, I was always just so anti what was going on with this um, so-called COVID lockdown. I went to the protests. I went and marched. And it was funny, um, when I went and marched, some people were scared, you know, because the police and everything were around, and they put a mask on. And I had my exemption uh, that I couldn't wear a mask because of health issues, and I had it in my pocket, and I walked around without a mask. And not one police officer or anyone came up to me to say why I'm wearing a mask during the protest. Uh, good on you, uh, good on you, Liz. It's uh, it's people like you who uh, collectively, uh, first there were a dozen, then there were a hundred, then there were a thousand, then there were tens of thousands, then there were hundreds of thousands, then there was a po th there was a situation where the government could no longer. Uh, continue. They could no longer ignore the voice of the people. We saw those scenes in Canberra. We saw those scenes in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane, Adelaide, everywhere with the, uh, in the smaller towns and cities. And in fact, some of the towns, the smaller communities, there were towns, townships where the whole town was unjabbed. <laughs> and you know, there were plenty of these stories where the government was trying every tactic possible giving grants, giving money to community leaders, to ethnic community leaders, targeting religious leaders, telling them, we want you to say, preach to your people, go and get jabbed, targeting the mullahs and the muftis at the mosques, targeting the priests and the pastors and the bishops in the churches, using the schools, targeting students through the schools, uh, using uh, any uh, means possible. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, look, a lot of people suffered. Now we realise it was a big deal, just a cold. You know, thankfully, I never got jabbed and my wife didn't get jabbed and I, I convinced her, don't do it. And now she says to me, thank you. 
She says, if it wasn't for you, I would have got it because she just wanted to do the right thing. She just wanted to obey the government and do the right thing and uh, uh, follow uh, the uh, quote-unquote health advice. People trust the government, but the government sh uh, has shown that it cannot be trusted and the government has shown yeah. that, unfortunately, they were, well, you know, they were part of the ge genocide. Yeah. yeah, what they showed was they were trying to make uh, the anti-jabbed like we were, we were dangerous to society for not getting the jab. Um, and that backfired because what happened, all the people that got the jabs and then, you know, you can look at uh, funeral parlours and this and that. They were just over, you know, um, overdone with uh, burials and everything uh, because of all the people that were jabbed that were crossing over. It's very sad. And, you know, a lot of them, uh, Liz, they want to do the right thing. They did it because they were forced. They were tricked. They were fooled. They were scared. They were uh, pushed, you know, a relentless campaign by the media. This isn't the end of yeah, this fight. There will, be, there, will be, there will be repercussions. And the role of independent journalists, the role of people like you, Liz, will be recognised in the future when uh, there will be... Uh, uh, there should be really a royal commission. There should be uh, a sorry day. You know, we have sorry day and what is it, reconciliation day for stolen generations and what was going on uh, in this country uh, regarding uh, the Indigenous. But what about the genocide against uh, the rest of us, including the Indigenous, who were also forced? I mean, they were targeting them. Remember what they were doing in Northern Territory? They were going around yeah. to these Indigenous communities and forcing them and targeting them and locking them down. It's so shocking. we're all in the same boat. We're... Yeah, it's uh, shocking. I'll tell you one thing I'll say. I did see David Icke and he got banned uh, the next time from Australia. And there was one thing he had um, that I always even put on Telegram and this and that is um, I will not comply, I will not lie down, I will not go quietly, I will not submit, I will not roll over and I will not shut up. How's that? 100%. Uh, very wise words. I agree with you. And guys, if you're listening on Telegram, uh, don't forget to download the TNT app or listen through the TNT online browser at TNT uh, radio uh, dot live uh, slash pop up player. That's the best way to listen to our show live uh, every Saturday night, five o'clock. Uh, Liz, I've got a story for you before you go. Yep. If you were watching the Aussie Cossack YouTube channel from the back in the days, do you remember during the election, do you remember a lady called Fiona Martin? Yes, yes. The MP from Reid, who in yep. the end she actually she actually lost her uh, she actually lost her uh, seat. Well, right. there there was an incident there which has hence since been uh, deleted from YouTube together with that whole Aussie Cossack channel, but. Um, uh, I'm actually due in court on Monday, the 24th of July, for a hearing relating to Fiona Martin. Fiona Martin uh, had a event, a pre-election event, an election launch, you could call it, and uh, there was uh, an opportunity there for me to attend uh, with a camera crew to ask Fiona some questions, as she's my local member. Right. Now, Fiona Martin didn't realize, but she probably she didn't realize, didn't realize, but she actually invited me because I live in the electorate to that launch. And I rocked up with a camera crew and microphone. Uh, they had the Australian Federal Police, they had police posted there uh, at the doors to the Dremoyne Sailing Club. And uh, yep. as I walked in, even though I had an invitation in my pocket, they actually arrested me. It was a very violent arrest. And uh, I pled not guilty. They charged me with Excluded person failed to leave premises when required. So this is going to be happening at Burwood Court on Monday. I've applied to appear via AVL as I'm in the consulate. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, only, it's only a $550 fine, but the concept, the, the, the point is to fight it. And yeah. uh, we asked the police, if you, want to, uh, if you want to charge us with this and have a hearing, well, you've got to get the witnesses. And one of the witnesses yeah. would be Fiona Martin because she invited me to this event. So... The police contacted Fiona Martin. They had no uh, luck, they reckon, in contacting uh, Fiona, which is, I think is hilarious. 
<laughs> it's a constable Gala or Gala from Build Police. He now oh, works at the Gala. Rotherham Park Regional. Gala sounds better. Yes, yes. He's, he works at the Regional <laughs> Enforcement Squad in Wetherill Park. So after he arrested me, it looks like he's got a promotion. And that's going to play out. But we'll bring you that story uh, next week on TNT Radio with the results of uh, that very interesting interaction which occurred and ended in an arrest. I'm confident, my lawyer's confident, that if they give us a hearing via AVL, it'll be a very interesting hearing and we'll, we'll win. We'll win uh, the hearing. But this is going back to the days of the lockdowns, the days of... Uh, back in the day, and these court cases are continuing. These court cases are continuing. So the government has abandoned its uh, policies of lockdowns and forced jabs, but a lot of people still have court cases in the mix, and still a lot of people are being charged with things like not wearing masks and things like uh, failing to use QR codes and not signing to premises uh, and COVID fines for being outside their five-kilometre zones. There has been speculation to remove those fines and the Supreme Court has ruled them uh, absolutely illegal. But unfortunately, the government still persecutes uh, everyday Australians for these type of offences, which should be really just uh, all pulled and ruled, uh, ruled, you know, dismissed or quashed, ruled illegal. Yeah, but what they're doing is illegal. That the jab was never, um, you know, tested properly or anything, and here they are telling everyone you must go and get a jab. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you don't even know what's in the jab. It wasn't. It wasn't ever uh, passed or qualified to be have a jab. Do you know what I mean? What's in there is what they've done is completely completely illegal and I hope um, you know in due course they're the ones that cop it back for doing something that was completely illegal you know um, what Dan the man did in Melbourne was just outrageous you know and look I've got to say um, I don't believe you know in the elections to me um, a lot of those things are just rigged Definitely rigged. There's no way that uh, I don't think he. They reckon he got thirty percent Victorians voting for him. I don't even think thirty percent voted, to be quite honest. And that's with oh. imagine that's with all the resources, with all the mainstream media on his side, and all the government resources that he had. He claims that he got thirty percent, similar to Albanese. He also got about thirty oh, percent. So again, yeah, the majority voted against them. Look at Albanese. He can't even speak properly. Yeah, he's a bit. He's becoming like Biden every day when I see him. It reminds me more and more of uh, Joe Biden. Uh, but uh, Liz, well, look, Joe I Biden thank you very much. Yep. I I'll just finish up. Joe Biden. The only good thing is when they do the clips of all the silly things he does. You know, it can give you a bit of comedy. But uh, they do think that's an act of playing him. But anyway. But anyway, thanks. Great to chat with you, and uh, all the best for Monday with the hearing thank you. and uh, thank you. Look, forward, look forward to hearing we'll, the update. We'll bring you an update. I think we'll bring a, a video out about that, uh, about that situation on Monday with Fiona Martin, uh, another outrageous, um, you could say, uh, a relic of the past, but it's still still going <laughs> with these, uh, the, the good old days of the uh, police interactions on the Aussie Cossack channel. But thank you for being a long time uh, viewer, listener, and supporter, uh, Liz, it's a pleasure to speak with you and wish you all the best. Uh, thank you, Liz. Now, guys, going through the news just before we go, we've got about three minutes to go. I have to make note of this, but one thing we've been talking about is uh, Russia uh, having a uh, purge, having a purge, purging potential political opposition, uh, purging uh, uh, people that... Uh, potentially have been involved in uh, subversive activities against the government, taking bribes, for example. Uh, we had uh, one of these outs most outspoken Russian commentators, uh, Igor Strelkov, actually arrested the other day. Now, something which I did predict that this is going to happen, although 
I didn't think it was going to be Strelkov uh, in particular. Uh, he's he's been uh, very outspoken for a long time now, and just quietly between us, I was wondering when is it finally going to happen? Because some of these th- things he says are true, some of the things he says are not. But who is Igor Strelko? For those of you listening in Australia, he is the first Minister of Defence of the Danish People's Republic. And he's actually uh, someone who I've met in person. Uh, the uh, Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph love to point out the fact that Strelkov and I have met previously in person. Uh, he was convicted in absentia, uh, in a kangaroo court style conviction by the Hague Criminal Court, International Criminal Court, uh, for his supposed alleged uh, role in the shooting down of MH17. But I, of course, maintained that that tragedy was not the fault of Russia or anyone, anyone on the Russian side. That was, uh, I would say that that was a Ukrainian uh, stray missile, and it was definitely the Ukrainian air traffic controllers who directed uh, that airplane, MH17, a civilian airliner with 38 Australians on board, uh, directed that in airliner into the war zone and actually ordered them to uh, lower their altitude to an appropriate level to where uh, they were shot down. So that's where the investigation should be focused. Why was an airliner directed into a war zone? As you can see now, if you look at the map of air traffic around Ukraine, no one flies above Ukraine's borders. It's a completely no-fly zone. Everyone avoids it like the plague but there are airplanes passenger liners flying all over russia there's no problem and for some reason russia is a safe place to visit russia is a safe place to to uh you know board a plane fly a plane there's no dramas igor stelkov arrested ex-deputy governor of the belgo region konstantin pozhalev arrested for a large bribe i think there are going to be more arrests especially of those people who take bribes and have been involved in siphoning off government money. Uh, Those people who are listening, uh, you know who I'm talking about. People in positions of power uh, who are doing that during wartime when the Russian people are valiantly conducting a fight against uh, the West and certain politicians and elites who ran away from Russia, flew out of the country and continued to steal. It's time to sign off for this week's Aussie Cossack Show. You're listening to Teen Radio. Teen Radio, it's been a pleasure Till next week, ladies and gentlemen.